In this next section of people, we're going to introduce Reginald Jack Evans and look at his experience of the First World War. Jack joined the Hearts Territorials in 1913 and was with them at camp in August the following year when war was declared. The Gazette account stated there was an immediate rush to respond to the call and the first to reach the hall was a Mr Evans. Others quickly followed on and soon the hall was filled with members of the local company, all highly delighted at the prospect of being able to serve their country. So Jack was the first man from Hemel Hempstead to enlist and was an example for other young men in the area. Jack served in F Company of the 1st Hertfordshire Regiment and after a stay in Bury St Edmunds was posted to France in November 1914. In October 1915, Corporal Evans was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal for a Moonlight Reconnaissance. So what's all this then? This is a tobacco team with some buttons. It's a luggage tag that you earn by Jack Evans. This is a, a tin with used to have bandages in. This is DCM, a 1914 star, a British War Medal, and an RI Victory Medal. These are various objects that were owned by Jack Evans. Here is a picture of Jack Evans as a child. Here is his notice of enlistment. Further down here we have his notice of demobilisation after he left the army. Over here we have an official guide on military tactics owned by Jack Evans. Down here we have a postcard sent by Jack Evans to his mother. And also a letter from Jack Evans' friend to Jack Evans concerning his current state of unemployment. Jack gave an account of how he earned his DCM. He wrote that They needed a volunteer to go out that night to report what damage had been done to the enemy's wire and front trenches by the intensive bombardment. The artillery received orders to cease fire for an hour, while well, the reconnaissance was carried out, but so as not to raise suspicion of the lull, machine guns would carry out the covering fire over the German lines. Whoever took the job on would have to go alone. It would probably mean death, but it would certainly mean glory. Jack volunteered to take on this highly dangerous mission and was able to complete it successfully. He describes his return to the British trenches from no man's land in the following account. The state I was in when finally I did reach our trenches can be imagined. Challenged by a century, I was almost too exhausted for replying. Thus with mud and clothing literally in shreds, it was almost unrecognisable even by the men of my own company. After making my report, I found an old dugout where I was only too glad to turn in the sleep. I've been out over an hour longer than was intended, picking up the loss, hence the recommencement of the bombardment which so nearly caused my death. After a few days, news came through that I had been awarded the DCM. I felt that I should need the attraction of a whole barrow load of decorations before undertaking another expedition of the same kind. The following year, in February 1916, Jack was badly wounded in the face and underwent pioneering plastic surgery performed by Captain Harold Gillies of Britain's first plastic surgery unit set up in Cambridge Hospital Aldershot. The type of surgery Jack received was truly pioneering. Although it must have been a traumatic experience for Jack, the techniques developed to treat soldiers injured during the First World War have helped countless others since. Today, plastic surgery continues to be used on injured British soldiers returning from Afghanistan and Iraq. External fixation methods, which were developed during the First World War, have been used in modern conflicts as a result of the injuries caused by high energy explosives with shrapnel. Jack made an impressive recovery and in September 1916 returned to a hero's welcome in Hemel Hempstead. He received a gold watch as a present from his employers. We'll now move on to the story of Christopher Cox. Christopher Cox was born Christmas Day 1889 and resided in Kings Langley where he lived a comfortable life with his wife Maud, his one year old son, until a recruitment meeting took place in the village church hall for volunteers and Christopher enlisted. On August 23rd 1915, Chris had his first real experience of trench life. The first night was spent relatively peacefully but real casualties began to occur and the whole trench warfare experience became all too real. Christopher Cox sustained an injury in his thigh from which this bullet was retrieved. 
Following year, in 1917, Cox sustained two further injuries on separate occasions. On one of his selfless endeavours rescuing injured soldiers from no man's land, Chris himself had received an injury. It wasn't until Chris had re rescued all the wounded men that he obeyed orders to report to a dressing station. Small pieces of shell casing had been blown into his leg. In fact, this piece of shrapnel was recovered from his calf. Chris had experienced remarkable luck in dodging the heavy barrage of gunfire, but eventually his luck ran out. These two bullets were embedded deeply in his foot, resulting in the requirement of surgery to remove them. This one's got kind of slightly rounded head to it. Yeah, it's still, this one's still very pointed. Mm. And you can tell it's quite heavy. Even though yeah, it's it's, it is, it. isn't it? Yeah, it's still pretty heavy. It would have left him pretty much immobile. Seeing the nerve endings you've got in your feet, it's a very concentrated area. You, you'd be he hard to move your feet when you walk at all. It's amazing that it's still in, untapped, even though it's been fired. Mm. Mm. It's amazing something so small can cause so much damage as well to people. This incident subsequently concluded his army service in France. This shell casing and detonator piece were recovered from the battlefield at Achier le Grand. Chris quickly learned that his role as a stretcher bearer exceeded the duty of carrying a wounded man to the aid post or dressing station. The reassurance and consolation Chris's presence gave to a vulnerable and wounded soldier literally became a matter of life and death. Stretcher bearers were treated more as individuals than other men. The bearers were instantly recognised by their SB armband and being only 16 in the battalion, they soon became known to most of the officers and men on a first name basis. Considering the nature of their role, Medical personnel were popular among the men, treating grievous battle wounds alongside infection and conditions like trench foot. Unfortunately, despite the best efforts of doctors and medics, many did not survive. The following quotations come from the soldiers who served alongside Christopher Cox. I previously saw him carry back a man on his back on three different occasions and on withdrawing my company I found he had similarly treated six others. Subsequently I saw him carrying a wounded man near the Star Crossroads where fire from both artillery and MG was heavy. The wounded man made a violent spasmodic movement and brought Cox to his knees. Cox got up and carried on. Private Cox saved many lives that day by risking his own and I certainly think he deserves the coveted honour. Christopher Cox received the Victoria Cross for his bravery. He greeted his family warmly and was overwhelmed with emotion. Over 16 million soldiers fought and died in the First World War. This makes one realise how vastly si significant these men were, not only for representing their country in the war effort, but also in the lives of their loved ones back home. From the People episode, we learnt about two significant individuals who were born and lived in the local area surrounding Bergenstead. Christopher Cox and Jack Evans were truly remarkable men whose courage in the face of battle is an inspiration to us all. Although their experience differed, both men were prepared to go out into no man's land, risking their lives for the war effort. It's important to remember those from the local area who fought and in many cases died for our country. These are only two out of hundreds and thousands of individual experiences, but we can already see just how different they are. We learnt that these men went to war to fight for their country. They were loyal, committed and selfless. Ultimately, there were normal men from the local area which makes them even more inspirational. DCM and Victoria Cross Awards respectively honour these two men.